Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you, Peggy. And I want to thank the organizers for having invited me to participate in this webinar today. And I'm just honored to be here with all of you and with my STEAM colleagues. Um, today, I'm speaking from Toronto. Uh, this is the uh, unceded territory of the new Mississaugas of the Credit. I'm going to be sharing my slides today. So just one minute, I will call them up and we'll see if we can get them going. There we go. Before I speak about policy challenges, I, I just would like to preface my remarks by saying two things. Peggy asked us what we learned from the pandemic and we've all learned a lot. And I think we've all suffered a lot of trauma each in our own ways. But if we've learned one thing, it's the impact of inequity. And we've seen inequities between nations, have and have not nations when it comes to vaccines. But even within our own country, we've seen serious inequities because the pandemic has disproportionately affected older Canadians, Indigenous communities, racialized Canadians, and marginalized workers. And so what an important time to be speaking about equity. And perhaps people can now understand the power and the impact of having equitable policy and how very important it is. Um, so I, I think this is such an appropriate time to be talking about the issue of healthy public policy and equity and what does that mean. I also wanted to say, just by way of preface, that healthy public policy, as my colleagues have said, is a very, very big subject area. And I won't have time in my remarks today to talk about all the aspects of healthy public policy, including things like income security, not only of older Canadians, but younger Canadians as well and child care and caregiver policy, a taxation policy and transportation and accessibility. All these are part of the conversation, very important parts. But I'm going to focus my remarks today on living arrangements and options for living arrangements for older adults in communities. So there are three policy challenges that I would like to address today, as you see here, the narrative regarding older Canadians, some of the options for older Canadians for living arrangements, and then the design of our policy options. So let's take a minute to talk about the narrative or the story. And Peggy made reference to the fact that words matter, and they absolutely do. But what also matters is the way in which you put those words together and the story that you tell. Because one of the most important aspects of policy and having good, healthy public policy is figuring out exactly what it is you're addressing. What is it you're defining as the issue of concern or the problem, as people say? Um, and in Canada, it's been really unfortunate that we have a pretty negative story about um, older Canadians. There is this notion of the silver tsunami, and part of that is rooted, of course, in the demographic story. And StatsCan published its uh, post-sensual data, which you know showed that the number of Canadians for the first time ever, or older Canadians, I should say, for the first time ever, outnumbered the younger the number of younger Canadians in Canada. And so there was this sort of image. And even before the census data, you know, this image of this big gray wave sweeping across the country, um, it's inappropriate and actually it's incorrect because we know, and, so, and my colleagues have said this, we have a, a group of younger Canadians, older Canadians and older, older Canadians. And um, their interests, their um, requirements, their uh, capacity, their living arrangements are actually quite different. And so this sort of big single group that's going to come along and swamp our healthcare system and our pension system it, um, it, it is actually an incorrect and a very negative narrative. Um, and as I, my colleagues mentioned, we really need to change that conversation from one of needs and incapacity and illness. And we find those negative concepts even embedded in the economic literature. You know, the OECD writes a lot about aging societies because it's it's the way of the industrialized world in any case. And you see reference all the time to the dependency ratio. And as soon as you cross this line from 64 to 65, all of a sudden you're, you're part of the dependent equation and, and you're, part, you're on the negative side of the ledger. And, and that I think it's a very, I think is a very serious concern. By the way, just one little positive story. I went in to check something um, just the other day 
in StatsCan, and there was a note on their website saying, we've changed the term seniors to older Canadians. And so somebody's listening, Peggy <laughs> and Jim. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. So what do we need to do? We have to start shifting from can to can't. Um, and as Jim was talking about, and Peggy was mentioning, we really have to put the focus on capacity, not inability. This was embedded too in the work that Irv, you were doing in the Ottawa Charter, active engagement and participation, and look at positive contributions. You know, there is some work underway in Europe, which is very interesting, saying if you have an, an, an older population, that means you've done something very well, and that you should be acknowledging the knowledge, the skills, the experience, the care that can be provided by older people. And I think we have to build into the notion of reciprocity, that as generations, we have something to offer each other. And it's not just one generation depending on the other generation, creating a burden for the generation. We can help each other in many, many different ways. And um, as Peggy mentioned, our our elders are so respected in the Indigenous communities. This is so important. We don't typically do that. I also want to talk about changing the narrative from needs to rights. And I know that there's a lot of concern oftentimes when you talk um, in rights language, because people always fear, oh, there's going to be a lawsuit or a charter challenge, or it's going to get very litigious. And I think from the perspective of this conversation, we're really talking about the right to a dignified life. And we're talking about the rights to some choices throughout the life course. And we typically don't have that now in communities. Here's what we have in policy options. And I characterize Canada as a two-door option when it comes to older Canadians and their living arrangements, either you're home alone, and maybe with some supports that you're able to buy or that are provided to you. But if they are paid for by community organization, you probably have very few hours of whatever it is that you have. Or you have support from an informal caregiver, and we have 8 million informal caregivers in Canada who provide millions of hours of care and just are, for the most part, unrecognized and need a lot more attention and support. But then at the other end of the continuum, you have nursing homes or some form of institutional care. There are those two doors and very little in between. And I think what we need to do is move here to many doors. We need many different options. And that's our challenge right now to fill in those blanks on the continuum. So here are just a few examples of future options. And I mentioned some programs just as illustrative, um, you know, examples only, because I know that there are a lot of people on the line who are doing some wonderful things and wonderful work in this area. I would love to hear your stories. So these are examples only. So if we start with the home alone, we really do need to build up the supports that we provide and provide assistance to those and recognition to those uh, informal caregivers. But in between, there's other options too. In other countries of the world, there are many different kinds of capacity-based home interventions. And I pick one, the Birdsark Health Coach model um, in the Netherlands, which is interesting because it's sort of um, groups of nurses, nursing units in communities. And these nurses go into the homes of older people and, and are health coaches in a positive way helping connect them to social links and helping them restore functioning in various areas. And we have a shortage of nurses in Canada, for sure. That's a serious problem. But if we could think about community-based health, uh, and we have examples of that in, in the country, but whether we actually are able to go into homes and help people from a wellness perspective, um, I think we still need to move in that direction. There's also a uh, municipality in Denmark that was sending personal trainers into people's homes and they were asking them, what capacity can I help you restore? Because we need to help people restore it and has their capacity and not just look from an illness perspective. So extended family options, you know, many communities and cultures uh, around the world um, live with extended family options. This is not a new thing, but good luck finding some of those housing options in Canada. When was the last time that you saw 
a home, for example, that had a whole accessible first floor with an accessible bedroom and washroom and living space, and then other bedrooms upstairs. We're talking now more about secondary suites. They used to be called granny flats. Um, municipalities in general are still struggling with how do you handle these things? Are they do we tax them? Are we going to disturb the neighbors? So there are a lot of barriers that are in place, unfortunately, because um, families really need these options and would welcome these options if they were available. Intergenerational models are a modification or a different kind of intergenerational living in which typically um, younger and older generations are living together, but they're not related. And there's so many really fantastic examples of intergenerational housing models and also learning and care and um, experience sharing and mentoring throughout the world that I, I think we really need to tap into and build. In terms of housing, what you see very often is students sharing accommodation with older people so they can get lower rent or no rent. And the older person has company and care and somebody shoveling their snow. Um, Co-housing arrangement. This is something very interesting that is percolating across the country. And I want to recognize um, this kind of arrangement that's now taking place. And it's unrelated people who come together to want to share a house. So you each have your own private room. And again, you share the common areas. This is not easy to do, and I want to send kudos out to Canadian Co-Housing Network, Abbey Field Houses, and many other examples across the country that are starting to develop these arrangements. And it's not just older people who want to do this. There are farm communities that are starting to have these co-housing arrangements. There are people with disabilities who are coming to live together in co-housing arrangements. We've seen some brilliant examples on a CBC recently. There was the Prairie Living Group in Winnipeg. Um, and I want to just, you know, mention some of these, the Blueberry Commons Farm Group out in Powell River, BC, the Treehouse Village Eco, um, Eco Housing in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, and uh, the Abundant Life Autism in Calgary. And I mention these just to say there's all different kinds of people who are really interested in this arrangement. The problem right now um, go talk to city planners. Many of them, you know, don't are not really aware of what these are, or there are bylaw barriers. And in fact, in 2019, an Ontario member uh, of the legislature put forward what he called the Golden Girls Act to make sure that these kind of housing arrangements were not prevented because they were being seen as illegal boarding houses. Go talk to banks, which typically don't understand that you, you have many people who are sharing costs. Speak to lawyers who don't know what to do when there are a lot of people trying to share uh, you know, uh, the legal work. Um, we have a lot of work to do in terms of getting this um, into more of a mainstream uh, option because many people would like to live this way. And I'll just talk briefly about care villages because I think this is very interesting. In the Netherlands, we see and in other parts of the world, even in Canada now, we see dementia villages. So rather than putting somebody in a room or on a locked ward, um, you create a village out of a few blocks. You have a safe village. People can walk in parks. They can go to gardens. They can go for coffee with their friends and buy some food. And nobody wears a white coat. All the staff is dressed in civilian clothing. And we have a village where we're caring for people in a safe way. And finally, we have nursing homes, and, and there are good nursing homes in the country, but we certainly know the work that needs to be done to improve those homes. So how do we move now to design our policy to have this range of options? So here is how we design our policy right now. In, in and we count how much it's going to cost, and we have, um, we go by order of government, or we go by population, typically in, you know, in these silos. Uh, we rarely pay attention to affordability and how can people afford to pay and we focus on one population group rather than say, how can we create solutions that will help uh, people generally in our community. So I think where we need to go is this way. And this is very messy and it's creative and it's colorful and it blends a lot of things together people and options, and I think that's where we need to go in our policy design. Multi-sectoral approaches, and we've talked about this before, this is not new. We know about, you know, across government, among orders of government, 
bringing in other partners from NGOs and private sector partners, and then some intergenerational decision making tables, bringing people together to co create and co design what we're doing. We also need to embed the concept of equity in everything that we're doing from two perspectives here, within the cohort of older Canadians and then between generations. And within the cohort of older Canadians, it's important to work on accessibility. And Jim made reference to age-friendly communities, Peggy did as well. What's really important about that is when you build accessibility into your water supply, when you make it a, an essential part of your design, what it means is that you're creating equity for everybody to participate. And you don't have the individuals having to pay the costs of that accessibility. That's really important. Then we have affordability, both of housing options and any of the aids and equipment you may need. This relates to our financing arrangements, and I'll get there in a moment. But again, equity between generations, as I mentioned, let's have those intergenerational conversations. To sum up our future directions, I think our conversation has to talk, as we said, functional capacity, talk about needs to rights and move to a discussion of choice of living arrangements with dignity and how accessible design engaging community planners, removing municipal barriers, the bylaws and all the, the kinds of the taxation that you know municipalities are worried about moving toward new financing or changing our financing in some way let's give incentives for some of these new housing options maybe we can look at wellness financing or healthcare financing is really illness care financing infrastructure financing typically goes to roads and sewers and bridges but it really needs to go to toward our community development and some of the uh, villages for example that we were talking about and i just want to mention finally the financing of local governments because this is a big problem in canada and it's certainly something that has been on the radar for a long time but it's going to take a while to resolve but local governments are under severe constraints because of the way in which they're financed in canada and they have very very limited revenue base which means which means that it's difficult for them to uh, do the kinds of things that we're asking local governments to do and so we have to recognize the need to finance local governments with respect to recreation engagement and this whole range of housing options that are so important for equity and for choice. So I'll leave one last thought with this. We need each other. We absolutely need each other. If the pandemic has taught us nothing else, it's the fact that we can't forget how we all have to care for each other. And if we bear that in mind in our policy making, I think we will arrive at healthy public policy and healthy older adults and Canadians generally. Thank you so much.